Hello, and as was already said, my name is Dirk Reiners. I am faculty member in computer science, and I'm also associate uh, faculty member in the School of Modeling and Simulation. So my activities span quite a wide range of, of topics, and that's what I would like to talk about today. Um, so uh, as you saw in the announcement, this was supposed to be a two people talk, but my colleague and co-director, Carolina Cruznera, unfortunately, um, had to deal with an unexpected visitor, which of which we have a lot, but uh, sometimes they come a little a little higher level and a little more unexpected. And today is one of those days. Um, so both Carolina and I work together. Uh, we joined UCF in, in 2020, so we're fairly new, and we direct the VAR lab. And the VAR lab stands for Virtual and Augmented Reality Applications Lab, and we. We run it sort of 50-50 between us, and we have one full-time research scientist that's sort of our uh, system administrator and, and general problem solver. The lab is sort of, a, I would call it a sort of small to medium-sized lab. We typically have between 10 and 15 funded students uh, that cover the whole range from undergrad to postdoc. Uh, and we have a fairly wide range of, of topics. Uh, that are all a little related to, as the title says, visualization of, of data. And I generally like to say we're, we are really interested in trying to help people make sense of large amounts of data in a visual means, using visual methods, uh, using whatever technology is the most appropriate for that. So both Carolina and I have been running uh, large VR, AR, XR research centers for more than 20 years. So... She has 20, I have 20, Carson has 20. So we have a lot of experience in doing this thing. And our focus is really the underlying technical challenges of creating innovative applications in those areas. So we're fairly applied. We love to work with other people. Um, we're, we're not the kind of scientists that like to look at their own label. We really like to help other people solve problems. So almost all of our work is interdisciplinary collaborations, both with other colleagues in this and other universities and with colleagues in, in industry. So our work is funded from industry as well as the conventional NSF and uh, NIH and other sources. But fundamentally, we are very applied and we're very interested in, in providing a usable result of our research. So the paper is, of, of course, an important step, but we want to go beyond that and have something that actually works. And sometimes we do kind of weird applications. So if you've seen the uh, last semester is Dan's final uh, presentation. We had a piece in there where we augmented some of the dancers using real-time interactive 3D graphics that was based on motions of the dancers. But we do a lot of um, sort of more serious applications too, of course. And one thing that really sets us apart and that differentiates us from many other groups that say that they're doing VR, AR, and XR research uh, is that we are very interested in display systems that go beyond the usual headsets. If you say you're doing VR, everybody assumes that you have to put a headset on and you use that to do the immersion, to involve you and immerse you into a computer-generated world. Uh, and that's perfectly fine for many applications and it's great for, for many sort of research studies where you really want to totally disconnect people from the real world and be fully immersed by themselves. But there's lots of applications for this, for which that is not a good match. We have lots of applications that we need to collaborate, that we need to work with other people, that we need to see what the people are doing in the virtual environment and be able to tell them, hey, you need to go to a different place and you need to do different things. And that is something that's very difficult with an h and And that's why we're very interested in other technologies. And the two main technologies that we use for this is either screen-based immersive technologies like the one on the left um, or projection screen-based technologies like the one on the, on the right. And there's pros and cons for all different kinds of applications. And uh, if this certainly rings a bell for you or if you're interested in this, I highly recommend just talk to me. We're very happy to show the lab to, to people. We're very happy to collaborate with other people. We collaborate pretty intensively with other people from industrial and civil engineering and we're always open to work with other people so if you're if you want to try things so if you want to experience it yourself uh just send me an email and we can set something up
So right now, I, for this talk, given that we've done these kind of talks before, I want to focus on topics that we've been working on in the last year or two to just uh, update anybody who's seen our previous talks and not repeating myself too much. And one of the things that really we've been focusing on that has been taking over a lot of the time, both of Carolina and me, is this topic of digital twins. And digital twin is, is sort of a buzzword right now. Everybody and their dog are doing digital twins. Um, what we're interested in is sort of the technological aspects of digital twins covering the whole pipeline. What do you need to do to make a digital twin really usable? And how do you support it in a way that really makes it possible to use them um, in a productive setting? And the first step that is always that has always been the problem and that has always been an important topic is this topic of data conversion, data processing. So we've been looking into automated pipelines. How do we get data that other people have from CAD or from LiDAR or from other sources into a VR environment and do it as automated as possible because we really don't want to do these things by hand. We looked at different tool chains. There has been different sort of commercial and non-commercial uh, systems that support individual steps, but usually not all of the steps. So we've been looking at different optimizations and different conversion methods of how do we get things into a format that is suitable for VR. And primarily with a look on how do we make this performance both to make it perform in VR and how do we make the tools fast enough that we can do this for large amounts of data on a daily basis. And this is work that we did uh, for, for Lockheed Martin in collaboration with them. And that is being used in the Lockheed Martin AR and VR uh, tool chain right now. A follow-up to that uh, specific for a specific topic is this idea of how do we how do we author augmented reality applications? Augmented reality has been sort of this high potential uh, sort of solution for a lot of maintenance and assembly problems. Since I did it back in the 1990s, AR has always been this perfect solution that nobody can get to work. And part of the problem is, is authoring. Because authoring augmented reality instructions is a very labor-intensive process. And that prevented people like, like Lockheed Martin uh, from deploying it at scale. And one of the things, and that's the animation that's running there, is a mixture of automatically generated animations for simple things like all the screws. And then the other problem that they have is that all these 3D models, they, they change as the process develops, as products are developed and updated, they change all the time. And right now, they did not have a way to maintain all this extra effort that they put into doing the animations and doing the instructions. Uh, it always had to start from scratch and had to be redone. So we developed a, an automated, and for the places where automation doesn't work, semi-automated tool chain that helps maintain all these uh, sort of additional information, these additional animations. Uh, and we did that for uh, the Air Force Research Lab for AFRL that are very interested in standards for these kind of applications. And we're continuing working with them and see how we can make this so that AR really finally, after, what, 20 years almost, uh, becomes something that really can be deployed at scale. So this is the one of some of the 3D immersive part. We're also doing other things that are um, sort of more information or analytics oriented. We have a whole bunch of different applications. That's why this slide shows a whole bunch of different things. Some of them are immersive, but we also work in traditional 2D desktop visualization, um, as long as it concerns large amounts of data and, and new visualization techniques. Everybody can do pie charts, bar charts, and line charts, and there's lots of tools that just do that out of the box. But again, in many cases, that's not enough. It doesn't give you enough, enough information density so we've been working with the Department for Homeland Security, trying to work in how can we visualize information about networks, connections between people, connections between phone calls, locations, other large amounts of data that they deal with on a daily basis, but don't really have good tools in, in helping them uh, understand what's in there and identifying uh, critical components. And then finally, as I mentioned, really what we've been working on very hard for the last two, three years now is this area of digital twins. 
Um, we have a lot of different activities in the lab, both different projects, and we do quite a few events. For example, I'm currently co-organizing the Digital Trends and uh, Perceptual Information, DTPI conference that we're going to have here in Orlando uh, in in a few weeks and in, in late October or November. Um, and we, we're organizing other events. So the, the core activity in this area is the Knights Digital Twin Initiative. That's a UCF presidential initiative uh, that really is Carolina's project. So I'm not gonna talk much more about that, except that I wanna say that we're really trying to establish UCF as one of the centers for digital twin related research. Uh, specifically, or really looking at how can we build a large digital, digital twin ecosystem. There's lots of people that build digital twins that are silos, but there's very few people that think about, okay, how can we connect all of these different pieces together in a way that makes sense so that we gain large, large scale value from this. But Carolina is going to talk more about that in her talk. Personally, um, I have two projects that are digital twin related that I would like to talk about a little bit. One is the microelectronics digital twin that is funded by the Environmental, uh, so the Economic Development Authority and a digital twin for drone swarm control project. So the, the microelectronics digital twin is a collaborative uh, proposal together, a collaborative project together with SMST. And we're working with the um, Skywater facility at Neo City and we're trying to build a uh, virtual version of a chip factory. So we, we're lo looking at simulating the chip creation and chip production process from start to end in order to simulate um, and optimize the production and trying to help them better understand how they can gain the most benefit out of the different systems that they have and what other systems they may need to acquire to, to really make this uh, facility work well. So the goal is to have a simulation like the one that we're looking at here for the whole factory and then hook up to live data streams that they are in the process of generating that give us a deluge of information uh, about the state of, of any individual tool and what they are doing right and what, what is going on and how to make better use of the whole system. So this is one, this is something that we're sort of in the middle of. Uh, very applied, very industrial oriented. Another project that we're working on is a little more sort of outreaching uh, and a little different uh, in, in direction. And this is really more targeted at um, defense applications. So we're talking to different DOD organizations to see how we can get this funded and how we can get people interested in it. And the background is that one of the main things that's been happening in uh, uh, in sort of the defense area is that drones are becoming more and more important. If you look at the news from Ukraine, which is sort of the, the most hot conflict that we have right now, there's almost nothing that happens without the involvement of drones. And one main topic that keeps coming up both there and here is that drones are starting or are becoming smaller and lighter and cheaper to the point that we now have, the military now has, and people now have drones that are sort of the size of, of a pen, uh, a fat pen, but a pen, uh, so that theoretically everybody could have like five or 10 of those in a backpack. It would not be a problem to have drone swarms that have 20, 50, 100 drones as part of a larger scale mission. But what happens then is, what do you do with that? One of the main problems is, what do you do with that? And how do you control this? What do you do with that in the sense that every drone, these small drones are not smart. They don't have a lot of sensors. All they have is a video feed. But then you have a wall of video feeds, of 100 video feeds, and you have no idea how they all relate to each other. And our solution, our proposed solution for that is a digital twin. So. What we have done is we developed a system that generates a base model um, of the environment that we're trying to deploy our drones in. And the drone video feeds are used to update the model in real time. So we have a, a 3D world that you can explore in virtual reality or whatever, using whatever methodology that makes sense, that changes as the drones fly around and that update uh, in real time as the drones fly around. 
we do that by keeping track of where the drones are and essentially stamping whatever the video feed is into the model. So, so that way we have always an, an updated 3D model of the, of the real world in, in our environment. And by doing that, we can also solve the second problem. The second problem is right now, drones are really remote controlled airplanes. So every drone needs a pilot, which is fine if I have two drones, which is not feasible if I have a hundred. So our goal is to have an automated system that can control these drones. And again, the bit twin helps with that because we're keeping track of how up to date or out of date different parts of the model are. So we can assign priorities and say, hey, this part over here, um, this part over here hasn't been updated in two minutes. I should probably send a drone there and make sure there's nothing happening there. And we can fully automate that. And that is an, an optimization problem that we're currently doing research on. What's the best way and the most effective way to, to use these variable sized drone swarms in keeping the whole model as up to date as possible. So those are two applications or two ways to use this digital twin concept for uh, a very different and, and sort of so far unsolved problem. We're currently working on extensions on how to use this for, um, for fixed cameras, because of course it also works if the camera is not moving for like security observations uh, or security applications. And right now the data is requires a, a 3D polygonal model uh, we're looking at, can we do the same thing with point cloud models? Because those are easier to generate with the LiDAR scanner, much easier to generate a, a point cloud than a, a polygonal, high quality polygonal model. But the data is very different. So we're, we're looking at how can we update point clouds in real time. And that's all I have to say. So thank you for your time. I, I hope I didn't run out of time. Um, and uh, Thanks everybody for being there and I'm open for questions.